Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters. We welcome you all to our, to our biblical address tonight. We also welcome all those who may be watching in on our online stream. We have been blessed in this current time to come together to learn more of the one and only true God, focusing on how the promises that he made 4,000 years ago are still relevant today. Leading us in this address is Mr. Gary Penn. And as this is a biblical address, we will be opening the evening in prayer, if you will all rise. O oh, our Lord God and Heavenly Father, as we come before thee now in prayer, we thank thee for the great and many blessings which thou hast bestowed upon us all. From thee is all life and all creation. Thou art the immortal and eternal, everlasting. And we are temporal. Dust we are, and unto dust one day we shall return. And yet, despite being yet in sin, thou gavest unto us a promise that it will not always remain so, that death will not always be the end. Thou gavest us a hope, a hope of eternal life through thine only begotten Son. Thou gavest us a promise. And so we ask that thou would open our hearts and minds this night, that we may hear the words of the speaker with understanding, and that it may prick our hearts and enter into our minds, that it may change the way that we walk our lives towards a path that leads unto thee. And be with the speaker, we pray. Put thy words into his mouth. For the world around us is descending ever deeper into darkness. And we pray for the soon return of thy Son to this earth, to deliver us from that darkness, and to set up thine holy kingdom. Through his name we pray, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. As an introduction to his address this evening, Mr. Gary has asked that we read from Hebrews chapter 11, verses 8 to 19. And we'll now ask Mr. Bradley Tregenza to read that for us. Reading together from Hebrews chapter 11, from verse 8 to verse 19. By faith Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should, receive, which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed, and he went out, not knowing whither he went. By faith he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Through faith also, Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of a child when she was past age because she judged him faithful who had promised. Therefore sprang there even of one and him as good as dead, so many as the stars of the sky in multitude, and as the sand which is by the seashore innumerable. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them, and embraced them, 
and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. But now they desire a better country, that is, a heavenly. Wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. By faith Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac, and he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called, accounting that God was able to raise him up, even from the dead, from whence also he received him in a figure. Thank you very much, Brad. We'll now ask Mr. Gary Penn to come forward to give his address on how a 4,000-year-old promises still relevant today. Shall I just wait for the fog to clear out of my glasses? Well, thanks, Jonathan, and uh, good evening, friends. So how are 4,000-year-old promises still relevant today? So firstly, what's a promise? It's a declaration or an assurance that one will do something or that a particular thing will happen. So that's what a promise is. And so I'm sure we've all had occasions when we have been promised something and perhaps we have become a little disappointed when that promise hasn't been actually uh, made good. But what we're talking about tonight is promises that God made in the Scripture and promises that were made 4,000 years ago. So 4,000 years ago, if you minus 4,000 from 2021, you get to 1,979 before Christ. And so at that time, the person in Scripture who was around, who quite a number of chapters in the book of Genesis is, are devoted to is, as we read in Hebrews, a man called Abraham. So who was Abraham? So um, Abraham, it's from Genesis chapter 11 to uh, chapter 25. So um, that's 14 chapters uh, that are devoted to the life of one man, or well, actually the life of Abraham and his wife Sarah. And so just very, very briefly, so we're going to do a whistle-stop tour of the life of Abraham just through the chapters. So in chapter 11, he's actually introduced as Abraham, and at that stage, he's living in a place called Ur. Um, sorry, something just popped into my mind. Uh, when I was in high school, uh, we used to have religious education, and we had a very, very tall uh, religious education teacher by the name of John Giddy, who we used to call Pope John. And uh, his comment when he was talking about Abraham was that he lived in Ur, and if everyone to remember Ur, you just need to go Ur and you bash your stomach and you'll make the sound. So be that as it may, um, sorry, I don't know why I have to tell you that, but never mind. So we introduced to Abraham, and he was living in Ur. All right, so in chapter 12, he moves from Haran, so he goes from Ur, and then up to a place called Haran, and he moves down into the land of Canaan. So just to give us some uh, idea of the geography of where he's at, um, he's in a place called Ur, Okay, so if you have a look here, this is something called the Euphrates River. And so Ur was just down by um, the, uh, the, that's the Gulf by the Red Sea. Actually, no, um, yep, that's right. That's the, uh, I forget the name of it, but the other Gulf by the Persian Gulf. That's it. So he goes up to a city called Haram up here, and then he comes down into Canaan. All right, so that's where he's come from, and that's where he ends up in the land of Canaan. So, back to uh, uh, our storyboard. So, in chapter 13, he separates from Lot. Okay, so Lot is his nephew, and uh, when he leaves, uh, in chapter 12, he takes Lot with him. Chapter 13, he separates from Lot. In chapter 14, Lot has a bit of uh, misfortune in that he and the inhabitants of Sodom, which is where he's living, 
are taken away uh, by f- uh, four marauding kings. And Abraham goes and rescues Lot. In chapter 15, there's a covenant that he makes with God. In chapter 16, uh, we have the account of Sarah and Hagar. And so by, at this stage of his life, Sarah, their lives, Sarah and Abraham had not had children. And as we'll see tonight, there's actually a promise of a child. And because that's not happening, Sarah says, here, you take Hagar, uh, my maid, and Abraham uh, has a, Abraham has a son, Ishmael, by Hagar, Sarah's maid, handmaid. In chapter 17, his name is changed to Abraham, meaning a father of a multitude. Um, in chapter 18, the angels visit Abraham. In chapter 19, God rescues Lot and destroys Sodom. All right, so it's the story of the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. In chapter 20, we've got Abraham and Abimelech. Uh, so when Abraham goes and, and lives in a place called Gera with a king by the name of Abimelech, in chapter 21, we've got the great joy of the birth of Isaac, Abraham and Sarah's son. And later on in that chapter, Hagar and Ishmael are ejected from the house of Abraham and they go off on their own, merry way, not so merry actually. In chapter 22, after just having his son being born, God asks Abraham to sacrifice Isaac to him. All right, so I imagine the terrible uh, feeling that Abraham had when he'd, ra- he'd waited for 100 years for a son. He was 100 years old or thereabouts when he had um, Abraham. Uh, when Abraham had Isaac, uh, and he's asked to sacrifice uh, Isaac. And we read about that tonight in Hebrews chapter 11 with Brad. In chapter 23, we've got the death and burial of Sarah. In chapter 24, we've got a wife being found for Isaac. And in chapter 25, we've got the uh, death of Abraham. So that's kind of like a whistle-stop tour. There's lots, lots, lots more. Okay, it's a fascinating story and a number of very important lessons that we learn. So if we go and have a look at where he went and all of that. So remember that we had put up the uh, going from Ur up to Haran and down to the land of Canaan. Right, so these are the travels of um, Abraham. Okay, so there's a whole lot of uh, references over here or particular events. But we just want to get the, the basic picture. So this over here, Canaan is the modern day land of uh, Israel. And so he comes down here when he comes from Haran to Shechem, and uh, then he actually goes all over. Um, So he goes all over and down actually into Egypt, and also into this area over here uh, in chapter 14. So you can see there's a plus over there as Sodom and Gomorrah. Okay, we'll come to that, whether that's uh, that's where Sodom and Gomorrah is uh, shortly. All right, so he actually traverses a large part of the land of Israel and uh, also down into Egypt, and he's come all the way from Ur by the river Euphrates. So if we have a look and um, we have a look at all the chapters that we've just put up, so uh, that's just uh, everything that we've already looked at, and we have a look at where there are promises, okay? So God made Abraham lots of promises, right? So we've got them in uh, chapter 12, in verses 1 to 3, and there's uh, some more in chapter, in verse um, 7 of Genesis chapter 12, in chapter 13, when he separates from Lot, uh, verses 14 to 17, in chapter 15, when he makes a covenant, in verses 3 to 6 and verse 18, there's actually a promise in between them as well about what's going to happen to um, the children of Israel. Uh, when they go down into Egypt, but we won't focus on that tonight. And uh, then uh, in chapter 17, when his name is changed to Abraham, there are more promises given in there in verses 1 to 8 and 15 to 16. So you get the picture, there's lots of promises. And then in chapter 18, when the angels visit Abraham in verses 9 and 10, and in chapter 22, uh, when Abraham is asked by God to sacrifice Isaac. So there's promises in Genesis chapter 22, and verses 15 to 18. All right, so lots of promises. God gives Abraham lots of promises. Now, remember where we started, where we said sometimes when we've received a promise, or perhaps we're still when we've made a promise, there's some disappointment that that promise is not fulfilled. 
Scripture says, so just come uh, just briefly to Titus, to the book of Titus. So Titus is in the New Testament, and it's actually uh, just before the book of Hebrews. All right, so um, be just uh, where we've got Hebrews, just before that we've got Philemon, and uh, then we've got the book of Titus. Okay, in the opening verses of Titus, in Titus chapter 1, this is what Paul says. Okay, in Titus chapter 1 at verse 1, Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledging of the truth which is after godliness, in hope of eternal life, okay, just have a look at this, which God that cannot lie, God that cannot lie promised before the world began. So what's the point? God has made all these promises. The Bible tells us that God cannot lie. So God is not going to let down Abraham as we go through the story of Abraham. God is not going to let down Abraham because God cannot lie. So when He says something, it is going to happen. And that's something which is a wonderful comfort when we have a look at all these promises. So we don't have time to go through all of those. So what we're going to do is we're going to have a look at Genesis chapter 12. Uh, we're going to have a look at Genesis chapter 13 and Genesis chapter 15 and Genesis chapter 22. So we're just going to take a selection of the promises to get a story, an overall story of what the story of the promises and the various promises that God made to Abraham. Okay, so that will give us an indication of what the 4,000-year-old promises are, and then we're going to have a look at why that's still relevant today. That verse that we just read is a key reason, God that cannot lie, so remember that verse. All right, so let's go first of all and have a look at Genesis chapter 12 at verses 1 to 3. So come with me in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 12 and verses 1 to 3. So, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be turning up the references, it's just a few pages on in Genesis as we go through, and then we're going to put them up on the screen and we're going to have a chat about each of the references and get to understand them a bit more. All right, so Genesis chapter 12, is everybody with me? Genesis chapter 12 and at verses 1 to 3. Okay, Genesis chapter 12 at verses 1 to 3. Now the Lord the writer says in Genesis chapter 12, Now the Lord had said unto Abraham, okay, remember his name only gets changed to Abraham all the way in chapter 17, so he's still called Abraham. Now the Lord had said unto Abraham, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. Okay? So, that's the first set of promises that are made to Abraham. So, what is that all about? Okay? So, if we have a look here, so there's the verses. Now, the Lord has said unto Abraham, Get thee out of thy country, from thy kindred, from thy father's house, and to land that I will show thee, and I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse them that curse thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. Alright, so there it is again. So, let's have a look, let's start unpacking this. Okay, so, if we have a look over there, there's the first promise, I will make of thee a great nation. So, what is God promising here? Well, what He's promising is that Abraham would have children. He'd become a great nation. So remember at this stage, it's only when Isaac is born, well, first, Hag uh, first by Hagar, Ishmael, that Abraham has a son, or Abraham has a son. But it's only when Isaac is born that Abraham and Sarah have children. Okay? But right back in Genesis chapter 12, there's a promise made, you're going to become a great nation. So you can imagine how excited Abraham would have been, or Abraham would have been, when he relayed that message to his wife, Sarah. And then it says, I will bless thee. And so, there's a promise that God says that Abraham would be blessed. And his name 
would be made great, so he would have a great name. All right, so you can see this is actually quite simple. It's just a matter of reading and understanding what is being said. And thou shalt be a blessing. Okay, so, so that should actually probably read being. Being associated with Abraham would result in blessings for those who are associated. So Abraham would bring blessings, and those associated with Abraham would be blessed, because he would be a blessing. Right, and then he says, I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee. Okay, so for those who want to go and be the friends of Abraham, there's a blessing. There's favor on those who bless Abraham. And there's a warning. If you curse Abraham or Abraham's seed, you're going to be cursed. I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee. And then in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. So the whole world, all families, this is not just local, all families. Okay, it's not bounded. All families, we actually told it's all families of the earth. So through Abraham, all families of the earth would be blessed. That's pretty spectacular, isn't it? That in this one man, because he was faithful, as we read in Hebrews chapter 11, and he believed, all right, but he's given a promise here, he believed in these promises that the whole world would receive blessings. Okay, so just remember, uh, so a pretty spectacular list of promises that are made in Genesis chapter 12. I'm sure you'd agree. So just remember that one, and these shall all families of the earth be blessed, okay? We're going to come back to that one. Just, just lock that away for the moment. All right, so that's Genesis chapter 12. What about Genesis chapter 13? So come over to Genesis chapter 13 and at verse 14 to 17. So Genesis chapter 13 and at verse 14 through to verse 17. Okay. So it says, And the Lord said unto Abraham, after that lot was separated from him, Lift up now thine eyes, and look from the place where thou art northward, and southward, and eastward, and westward. For all the land which thou seest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed forever. And I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth, so that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then shall thy seed also be numbered. Arise, walk through the land, in the length of it and in the breadth of it, for I will give it unto thee. Okay, so there's the promise. So let's just read that again so we make sure we understand up on the screen. The Lord said unto Abraham, after that lot was departed, he separated from him, lift up now thine eyes and look from the place where thou art, northward, southward, eastward and westward, for all the land which thou seest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed forever. And I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth, so that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then shall thy seed also be numbered. Arise, walk through the land in the length of it and in the breadth of it, for I will give it thee. Okay, so let's have a look at this. So firstly, did you notice, it's not part of the promise, but it's a very interesting thing. Oh, I suppose it's part of the promise, but he says, lift up now thine eyes and look where you are. Northward, southward, eastward, westward. So there's a direction given by God to Abraham. Look at all the points of the compass. So we can imagine Abraham looking, but uh, you know, not, as, not as fast as this, because I always get dizzy like me, uh, but looking throughout all the points of the compass, because God has said, I'm going to give this land to where you are, to, to you and to your seed forever, this land where you are. So let's have a look about, go back to this particular map and just understand where um, Abraham is at this stage, or Abraham is at this stage. All right, so um, we know from the context, and have a read of it in your own time, but we know from the context of chapter 13, well, actually, let's just, uh, uh, because it's um, just a couple of verses. Verse 10, it says, basically the story is that Abraham and Lot's herdsmen were arguing, and they didn't want to have strife between them, so Abraham says, choose where you want to go. Lot, choose wherever you want to go. And Lot, in verse 10, lifted up his eyes and beheld all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere before the Lord, Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. So we're given some direction as to where he was. 
he was able to see the plain of Jordan. Okay, it was even as the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as thou comest unto Zoar. So Lot chose him all the plain of Jordan, and Lot journeyed east, and they separated themselves the one from the other. And Abraham dwelled in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelled in the cities of the plain, and pitched his tent toward Sodom. Okay. So, we've got the plain of Jordan and Lot going towards Sodom. Now, so what this says, this map says, is that's, that's where Sodom and Gomorrah, and it's got a question mark there, it's got a question mark of where Sodom and Gomorrah is. But what we actually believe, and it's actually been proved by a um, really amazing biblical um, architect who's known to many of us, uh, in the research that he's done, is that it was more likely to be round about there where the purple dot is. Okay. So it was more likely to be, that's the Jordan River over there, because it speaks about the plain of Jordan. So what does that look like? So um, if you have a look, now this is not where Abraham was and Lot was standing, or Abraham was standing, but it gives an idea, a contrast between the two. Okay, so this is uh, what would have been behind Lot, the type of scenery that would have been behind Lot when he looked for where he was going to go. So this actually here, if you remember the uh, parable of the Good Samaritan, where he was going down from Jerusalem to, Je the person was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, remember that? This over here is actually the road, uh, or near where the road was, where that story is set. So this is just outside of Jericho in, the, in uh, Israel. Right? And so it's a very inhospitable. But then, and this again is, um, th this is the modern city of Jericho, uh, which is um, uh, higher than the Dead Sea. The Dead Sea is down to the left. But what do you notice that the difference? Is that it's green. Okay, so just over here, if you can see very clearly there, Jericho is known as the city of palm trees near the palms. Okay, but what you can see, there's this whole green space over here because that's where the Jordan River goes and the Dead Sea is further down. So, that's where Lot went. But if we have a look at where Abraham and Lot would have been when he was able to go and see the well-watered plains of Jordan, I think my batteries are running out, there we go. All right, so um, this is a cross-section of the um, land of Israel. And so Jericho is round about somewhere over here, and Jerusalem's just up here, all right? So, but they would have likely been standing somewhere over there to be able to see the well-watered plain of Jordan. So this is the well-watered plain of Jordan. Because remember, as it says in the record, it was very different because it was before Sodom and Gomorrah were overthrown uh, by, no doubt, volcanic activity or something along those lines, um, or potentially um, something more spectacular than that too. So, why are we showing the slide? So, um, if you have a look um, at this over here, where, if, if they were standing where they say Sodom and Gomorrah is over here, they would not have been able to see the well-watered plains of, uh, of um, Jordan. Okay, so it's likely that he was standing up in the hill country of Judah. Okay, which is, and it's quite fascinating because if you look over here, there's actually a, if you go from the Dead Sea up to Jerusalem, it's a 1,200 meter ascent, okay, so it's 1.2 kilometers, the Dead Sea is 1.2 kilometers lower than Jerusalem. Even the Sea of Galilee is uh, about 220 meters, or 211 meters actually below sea level. So a very low part of the earth. But if that's where they were, and uh, let's say, for example, um, that is there in the hill country of Judah, what he says, what God says is look northward and look southward, and look eastward, and look westward, all the land which you see, I'm going to give it to you. Isn't that an amazing promise that God gives to Abraham? Okay, go there, and then he says, walk through this, because where you walk, the inference is where you walk, I'm going to give it to you. Where your feet go, that's what you're going to get. Okay, which is why the map of the journeys becomes important. All right, so with that in mind, all the land which thou seest, to thee will I give it unto thy seed forever. Okay, so he's promised 
a personal possession of the land. And it's the land of Israel, modern-day Israel. Okay, there can be no doubt that that's what's being promised because that's where Abraham was, that's where Lot was. Those are the hallmarks, the, almost the GPS coordinates that are given to us in the Genesis record. Okay, so he was promised a personal possession of all the land he could see. And when, um, so, uh, I, I took those photographs, and it's amazing when you come over the hill and you're going down uh, from Jerusalem down to Jericho, and how you can just see for miles and miles and miles. This incredible expanse opens in front of you. And you're peering through the smog and pollution of modern day, which Abraham wouldn't have had to have done. And when he's standing there, he would have been able to see who knows how far away. He'd have been able to see the length and the breadth of the land of Israel and beyond, even further. And he is told by God, I'm going to give this to you, Abraham. He's promised a personal possession. Imagine how exciting he would have been when he received those promises. In that, it's also a promise of land to Abraham's descendants. Okay, I'm going to give it to you and to your seed. And he didn't have any descendants. But what's more... And I didn't put this up. I've just realized I didn't put this up. See those two words over there? It's forever. So this is something that is a perpetual inheritance. It's a perpetual promise. When it's given to them, God says, nobody's going to be able to take it away from you forever. And when God, who cannot lie, says something, he means it. So what else is in here? is the promise of the descendants, because he didn't have a child. And then it says, I will make thy seed. So how many descendants? I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth. So a promise of an innumerable number. They can't be counted. So if you want to go and scoop up sand on the seashore, because there's another allusion to that a bit later on, sand on the seashore in a teaspoon, and try and count the number of grains. And God says, it's going to be like the dust of the earth, or like the sand on the seashore. That's a very large group of people, isn't it? They won't be able to be numbered. Okay. And then, as we said, he says, Arise, walk through the land, and the length of it and the breadth of it. So go and survey your inheritance, Abraham, because I'm going to give it to you. So, again, really spectacular promises. And if you have a look at where he walked, what has God just said to him in chapter 13? is arise, walk through the land in the length of it and the breadth of it, for I will give it to thee. And look where he walked, where his feet trod. And he would have been able to see all, as he looked northward, he would have been able to remember how that he came in over here in chapter 14, how that he went up to Damascus to go and rescue Lot. So there are a whole lot of things that have been coming flooding back to him. And where you walk, that's what you're going to get. That's what God says. Pretty special, isn't it? Pretty amazing. So, what about chapter 15? So let's have a look at chapter 15 and at verse 3 to 6 and at verse 18. So in chapter 15, Abraham says, okay, Abraham says, behold, so Abraham is asking God, he's, he's, he's Wanting confirmation from God, what's going to happen? He says, Behold, to me thou hast given, in verse 3 of Genesis 15, no seed. And lo, one born in my house is mine heir. So Abraham actually recognized that God would fulfill these promises. And so God says, Behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine heir. And so in verse 2, he's actually said, Is Eliezer of Damascus going to be my heir? So he says, this shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. And he brought him forth abroad and said, look now toward heaven and tell the stars if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, so shall thy seed be. And he believed in the Lord and he counted it to him for righteousness. Okay, then verse 18. In the same day, 
the Lord made a covenant with Abraham, saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land, from the river of Egypt unto the great river Euphrates. And then he goes and lists a whole lot of uh, nations that are living in that area. And so he's actually, uh, that, that's pretty amazing. And we'll read that again when we put it up on the screen. Okay, so let's have a look firstly at chapter 3, uh, cha verses 3 to 6 of chapter 15. And in particular, uh, where it says in the fourth line down, Behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. And then he, God brings him abroad and says, Look now toward the heaven and tell the stars, If you can number them, so shall thy seed be. And Abraham believed in that. Okay, so, what does Abraham promise? Well, firstly in this, he's promised that Abraham was going to be the father of a son, right? He was going to be the father of a son that would be his heir. So Abraham himself would be the father. Whereas Eliezer, who he put up as a proxy, that wouldn't do. God is saying, it's going to come from you, Abraham. And then he's given this amazing promise, look now toward heaven and tell the stars and so the promise of an innumerable number of descendants. So similar to what we've just had in chapter 13. At this time, as the stars of heaven, as the stars of heaven, and he believed. So again, amazing promises, and Abraham believed them. And God counted it to him for righteousness. He believed that he would father a child, even though it seemed impossible. And uh, Paul takes it up actually in Romans chapter 5, I think it is. Chapter 4 or chapter 5. Right, so, what about verse 18? In the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abraham, saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land, from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates. So again, we're almost getting GPS coordinates here. In fact, we're getting very well-known landmarks. Landmarks that we know today. Right, so he's given a promise of a land and he's actually given an identification of the geographic boundaries. Isn't that amazing? That's what he's promised. So when we have a look, and that's why we've got both maps here, in the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abraham saying, unto thy seed have I given this land from the river of Egypt the Nile River, to the river Euphrates. So all of this area here, okay, all from the river Euphrates, all the way across and down through Syria and down to the border of Egypt, to the, the uh, river Nile, all of that area has been promised to Abraham. Isn't that incredible? And... No surprises, because God had said, arise, walk through it, in the length of it and the breadth of it. This is all the area that he actually walked. Okay, uh, up when he first came into the land, and all over here. It's amazing how accurate the Bible is, isn't it? And how, how precise God is. Quite spectacular. Right, so, what about Genesis and chapter 22? So in Genesis in chapter 22, right, so this is the story or the account of when God asks Abraham to offer up Isaac. And immediately, well, not immediately because it was not, the very morning he wakes up early and he takes Abraham, Abraham takes Isaac and he takes him uh, up to a particular mountain and he lays him out on an altar and he's about to to plunge a knife into Isaac to kill him, when God, the angel of God, stays his hand. And because of his faithfulness, this is what is said to him, this is what is promised him in verses 15 to 18. In verses 15 to 18. The angel of the Lord, in Genesis chapter 22, at verse 15, the angel of the Lord called unto Abraham out of heaven the second time and said, by myself have I sworn, saith the Lord, for because thou hast done this thing and hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, that in blessing I will bless thee, 
And in multiplying, I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is upon the seashore. So where have we heard those words before tonight? Right? So I'll multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is upon the seashore. And thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because thou hast obeyed my voice. So, let's read it again on the screen. Okay. The angel of the Lord called unto Abraham out of the heaven the second time, and said, By myself have I sworn, saith the Lord, because thou hast done this thing, and hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, that in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven, and as the sand which is upon the seashore. And thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies, and in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because you've obeyed my voice. Okay, so when we're having a look at these things, words become very important. All the words are important, but we need to pay attention, particularly in this promise, and you'll understand what I'm saying in a moment. But remember that the first quote that we went to, right, back in the book of Titus, okay, so he says here, by myself have I sworn, okay, so just remember that, okay, but the promise that in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is upon the seashore. So basically there, what God is saying is he's restating and confirming the promise that he's already made in chapter 13, which is as the dust of the earth, or as the sand upon the seashore, and then in uh, chapter 15 that we just read, uh, the stars of heaven. Okay, so God is promising it to him again. I'm telling you, Abraham, this is really going to happen. That's what the import of that is. Right? And then, thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. Okay, so this is where the words become very important. Because if you have a look over here, in what we just read in the now grayed out part, that's speaking about lots and lots and lots, an innumerable number of descendants. But did you notice that there was a change in the pronoun that is used in Genesis chapter 22? Okay, where it says, over here, thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. So there's a change here. Before, God is talking about there's going to be lots and lots and lots and lots, and now he's saying there's going to be one really important one. So there's going to be one descendant, which is going to be a particular focus or the promises that God, or the outworking of the promises that God has made to Abraham. All right? So, there's a promise of a particular person. There's a promise of a particular person who would be a descendant of Abraham. Okay? Because it's the his seed. Sorry, sorry it's the his enemies over there. And what's more, that particular person would rule over his enemies. That's what it meant in olden times, to possess the gate of your enemies. Because if you possess the gate, typically there was only one gate to enter and leave a city. And if you had control of the gate, you controlled the city because you could do what you liked. And you could let in who you want to do and let out who you want to do or, more importantly, prevent people from coming and going. So what the promise is is that this one particular uh, person would possess the gate of his enemies. Okay, and again, words, it's not hers enemies, it's his. So it's going to be a male descendant of Abraham. Then, in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. Well, that's got a very familiar ring to it, doesn't it? Because that's kind of like Genesis chapter 12 where I said, remember this, lock this away, in thee shall all, may all families be blessed. Now, I've forgotten the exact words, so let me just go and read them to you. Uh, in verse 3 of Genesis chapter 12, uh, in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. Okay, so in Abraham, all families of the earth be blessed. But now what it's saying, there's more definition being given over here, because it's in thy seed, 
Which seed? The his. And that particular person who's going to have a very special role in the outworking of the promises to Abraham. Right, so, it's almost like the promises to Abraham are bookended by, in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed, and in this one particular seed who Abraham has promised when he goes and takes his son, his only son, and offers him up on an altar to God, he's promised a particular seed in whom all nations of the earth would be blessed. So, fantastic, isn't it? The promises, amazing. Just remarkable. And, as we said, by myself have I sworn, saith the Lord. God has promised. God who cannot lie has sworn. He's made the promises. God who cannot lie and he gives that to Abraham. I've sworn to you, Abraham, this is what's going to happen. And so Abraham would have been exceptionally confident in the fact that God had promised and God would fulfill. The other thing which is interesting, even though in the previous promises he'd been promised a seed that would come from him, and that was Isaac, it's obvious, because he's got Isaac in Genesis chapter 22, that God is talking about another person here. Right, so, as his batteries are running down, there we go, some remarkable promises that are given um, as we've read. So, there's a question that we need to ask ourselves. So, why to Abraham in particular? Why was, did God make so many promises to Abraham? So, when he goes, um, I'll just put the quote up here because of time, when he goes in Genesis chapter 18 to tell Abraham that he's going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, he says, shall I hide from Abraham that, which, that thing which I do, seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed with him. And so here we've got the angel of the Lord talking to two other angels. And so they are again confirming that God has promised these things. He says, shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do? For I know him, that he will command his children and his household after him. And they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment, that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he hath spoken of him. So an incredible endorsement by the angel of God, the angel of the Lord, about the character of Abraham. Isn't that amazing? Isn't it, wouldn't it be lovely if God said the same about us? But something that we can aspire to. So, the summary of the promises to Abraham. First of all, as it says in Genesis chapter 15, Abraham believed. Okay, that is something which is really important for us to understand. Abraham believed with all his heart. And it was counted, counted him for righteousness, it says. So, what is he promised? He's promised a land in Genesis chapter 15. He was given the geographic boundaries. He walked through it. He looked north, south, east, west. He knew exactly the geography of what he'd been promised. He's promised to land. Right? He's promised many seed. He's promised a seed without number, as sand which is upon the seashore, as stars which are in the heavens. And he's promised a particular seed through whom all nations of the earth would be blessed who would possess the gate of his enemies, who would rule over his enemies. So we've got a ruler, we've got a nation or innumerable nation, we've got people, and we've got land. So what has Abraham promised? Well, he's promised a kingdom. Forever, an everlasting kingdom. That's the summary of the promises to Abraham. So, going back to our, our title, and I might just move behind here because this uh, needs new batteries. So, going back to our title, how are these 4,000 years promises? So, we've had a really good look at the 4,000 year old prom promises, the 4,000 year old promises. How are they still relevant today? So, 
And probably another question is, so, so what? Why is this important to me? Why is this important to each one of us as we are sitting here in 2021? Well, let's have a look at this. So firstly, as we said from Titus chapter 1 at verse 1, and as was confirmed in Genesis chapter 22, they're relevant because God has made the promises. God cannot lie. God, because he's made the promises, God will make good on his promise. He will fulfill them. So what we read with Brad right at the beginning, and come to Hebrews chapter 11, our reading, and so we chose Hebrews chapter 11 because hopefully as we were going through, some of it was a little bit familiar because some of it was told to us in Hebrews chapter 11. But let's go to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. Okay, at verse 9, or by verse 8, by faith, Abraham, when he was called, so he left Ur, that he should receive a heritance. He came down from Haran by faith in verse 9. He sojourned in the land of promise, as in a strange country, dwelling in tents, as tabernacles is. Okay, so he didn't even have his own, uh, he had to go and buy a grave for Sarah. Right? And uh, through faith, we spoke about uh, Isaac being born in verse 11. Therefore, in verse 12, sprang the even of one, and him as good as dead, as many as the stars in the sky for multitude of the stand which is by the sea innumerable. So part of that's been fulfilled. But has Abraham got the land? Is there a king over that land? What it says in verse 13, these all died in faith, not having received the promises. Abraham hasn't got the promise yet. He hasn't got it. But he believed. It says there, these all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them, and embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if they'd been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they may have returned there. So if, they, if, they, if Abraham hankered back to Ur of the Chaldees, he could have gone back. But in verse 16, they desire a better country, a heavenly country. Wherefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, because he has prepared for them a city. So what that's telling us, friends, is that Abraham died, but he died in faith, knowing that he would receive the promises. So how can Abraham receive the promises if he's dead? Well, he's got to be raised. He's got to be resurrected so that he can receive the promises. Okay, so he's not received the promises as yet. So... That's all good for Abraham, but again, how are these relevant to us? So come across to the book of Galatians. Just come back to Galatians and Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3 at verse 6. Even as Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. So where have we heard that before? Well, we've heard that in Genesis chapter 15. That Abraham believed, and it was counted to him for righteousness. Know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. So what Paul's saying here is that if you have the same faith as Abraham in the promises that God has made, even though they're not fulfilled, but you believe that God is going to fulfill them, well, then you are the children of Abraham. So there's more to it than that, which we'll come to in a moment. Then he says, the scripture in verse 8, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen, or the Gentiles, through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, in thee shall all nations be blessed. So... The relevance of the promises that are 4,000 years old is actually the gospel, the good news. And that's the good news, the gospel that Jesus preached. That Jesus preached. 
the good news of the kingdom of God. And so how is this going to be accomplished? Well, it's going to be accomplished through one descendant, the his seed that will possess the gate of his enemies. And in Matthew chapter 1 at verse 1, the New Testament opens with words that remove all doubt about who that seed is. The book of the generation, Matthew 1 at verse 1, the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And so Jesus is that one seed. And the gospel, which was preached to Abraham, was that God would provide a son of Abraham and the son of God. And it's the story of, the, of that promise. Well, that promise is made when Isaac, just, when Isaac has just almost sacrificed his son. And the angel says, because you've not spared your son, your only son. And so there's another father who had an only son. God gave his only son as a sacrifice for the world that if we believe on him and obey his words, we can be saved. So we can see the thread coming through this. So how can we be associated? How do we get the promises? Go back to Galatians in chapter 3. Sorry, I should have told you to keep a hand there. But in Galatians in chapter 3, at verse 8, the scripture, or sorry, verse 7, Know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. So then, he continues, they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. So how do we go and demonstrate that we are faithful? And, and, and when we had a look at those promises, isn't that amazing? I mean, I mean, that is just something that is spectacular. And we can be blessed with Abraham. That's what's on offer here, being blessed with Abraham. Isn't that something incredible? So how does that work? Well, we can also receive the promises. Just go over the page in Galatians chapter 3 and at verse 27. Well, verse 26. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ's, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So do we see the relevance, friends, of 4,000-year-old promises? Because they're not yet fulfilled. But God, who cannot lie, who swore by himself, is going to fulfill them. And Abraham and Abraham's descendants, Abraham's seed, are going to be the beneficiaries of that promise. And we can be Abraham's seed if we are baptized. It's not a case of doing a, you know, basically going and getting baptised and then, right, I'm done. You know, I'm, uh, I'm as, as good as uh, in the kingdom of God. There's, there's a bit more to that. And that's why we spoke about why did Abraham receive all these promises. So what should we do? So in the book of Matthew, uh, in chapter 28, verse 19, it says, Jesus, just before he was going to ascend into heaven, said to his disciples, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So there's the baptism. But then he goes on to say, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. That's why we went and spoke about why the promise was given to Abraham. Because God knew Abraham, that he would follow his ways. And so that's what we need to do too. But the start of that is with baptism. And then to walk in the footsteps of Abraham. 
that by God's grace, when Jesus returns to the earth so that Abraham and establishes God's kingdom, when God's will will be done on earth as it is in heaven, and Abraham is raised from the dead and he once again walks through that land which he's walked on all those 4,000 years ago as his personal inheritance. By God's grace, we will be able to walk with him and enjoy the kingdom of God forever. May God bless each of us to that end. Thank you. I believe I speak for all of us when I say thank you to Mr. Gary for his words this evening. Or, Dad. <laughs> now, we will do welcome you all to our lecture next week, which will be to the subject, Questions Evolution Can't Answer, Answers from the Creator, which will be, be given by Mr. Nathan and Mr. James Taylor. To close this evening, we will be closing in prayer, followed by a supper which will be delivered to, to you. And we'll ask Mr. Timothy Penn to close in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank you that we can meet and look at these amazing promises which you gave to Abraham. We thank you, Lord, that you gave your son, your only son, whom you loved, that you gave him away to be sacrificed, that we may be received these promises, that we may have the opportunity to have these blessings through him as he is the seed of Abraham. May we therefore follow the words and the actions of, the, of your son, and of you, that we may receive the inheritance, we may receive the kingdom and the land which you promised Abraham, that we may receive the blessings that you said to Abraham that in him all nations shall be blessed, that we may be heirs according, unto, according to the promise. We thank you as well for the supper which you have provided to us. May we use the energy gain from it wisely. May we, may we redeem the time that we may follow thee in all things. Through Jesus Christ, amen.